Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this um, workshop webinar for the BioXL uh, workshop in uh, best practices in QAM simulation, biomedical systems. Uh, I won't take too much time, especially because people who have been to the, the previous webinars will already know um, what this is all about. Just to restate very briefly that what we're trying to do with these, is this, this workshop is uh, to really look at uh, a variety of perspectives from, from very experienced practitioners who are using QMM simulation uh, in, for biomolecular systems and let's look at what insights they've gained about what's good practice, robust protocols for simulation, things to look out for, pitfalls, um, and also perhaps in some cases, some ideas about software to use. So to introduce today's speaker, we have uh, Professor Maria Joao Ramos from the University of Porto. Uh, Maria heads the group uh, of theoretical and computational biochemistry uh, at the University of Porto. Um, she has an extremely long list of publications and ha has had a long, uh, a long list of high profile positions, which uh, I didn't want to put here, but I just want to highlight uh, Maria's research interests and expertise, uh, especially as relevant to the workshop. Um, so, uh, Maria's research expertise is with, is with regards to computational enzymatic catalysis. And there I thought what stood out to me in particular was a number of publications that she and her group have done on benchmarking and suitability evaluation of DFT functionals, uh, which I think is a really interesting topic and really valuable um, for people who are coming to QM simulation fresh. Uh, and I think she might touch on this today in the presentation. Uh, other areas that Maria has done research in and published extensively is approaching dynamics, computational genesis, I think using uh, and PBSA, and molecular docking and, uh, and drug discovery. And uh, Maria was also awarded in 2019 the uh, Medina Beta <laughs> Learning Surprise Prize by the Spanish Royal Society of Chemistry. <laughs> I did my best. Um, okay, so uh, I will, uh, with that, having, having said that, I will hand over the reins now to Maria. I just wanted to say hello to everybody and uh, uh, thank also Arno and Emiliano and uh, Herit uh, for uh, um, organizing this series of uh, seminars and obviously for inviting me uh, to be here um, and to talk to you about um, studies on enzyme catalyzed, uh, catalyzed reactions which is quite a, um, uh, a general uh, name uh, and uh, today I am going to uh, focus on uh, mechanisms of enzymatic reactions and for that uh, I would like to tell you first what I uh, want to know from when, I, when we establish a mechanism of enzymatic reaction and to just give you an example of exactly what we want, uh, I, uh, my first slide uh, uh, features the uh, uh, thiol disulfide exchange mechanism, which is uh, not terribly complicated. It consists on a nucleophilic attack of, uh, by a methyl uh, thiolate on a disulfide bond. Uh, it breaks it and it, uh, another one is made. And uh, one of my um, ex-PhD students, uh, Rui Neves, who's now a, um, has a research fellowship in my group of research, um, has done a very nice work on the reduction of glutathione disulfide by PDI and uh, uh, using exactly this exchange mechanism, which is actually used in many uh, systems uh, in, in biology. And uh, what he did was what we knew at the end of it and all the other many uh, enzymatic uh, uh, mechanisms that we have established uh, is the, uh, all the geometries and the energies of all the, the states that are important, such as reactants, transition states, uh, intermediaries, products. And by knowing all this, we can actually visualize the mechanism. We know all the steps, we know everything. And Rui uh, has done uh, a very nice video of uh, which is done with all these geometries that uh, he calculated. So this is PDI. And here is the active center, 
And as you can see, we've got, for the first step of the mechanism, we've got here the disulfide bond, the methyl uh, thiolate that is attacking it, the bond is broken, the other one is formed, and here it goes again. There's another methyl thiolate that is forming here, which is going to attack again the disulfide bond and form a new one. And as you can see, uh, and I can't, I mean, I was very happy to be able to visualize this. This gives us ideas and it's clear, very clear. And that's what we want. We want at the end of the day uh, to understand exactly what goes on with an enzyme when it reacts. Yes, the orders of magnitude of enzymatic rates of reaction based on experiment. So you can make an educated guess. And that's what we used to do all the time. And by educated guess, I mean, you know that if uh, 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 the rate of a reaction uh, gives you a delta G of activation, which goes, say, 30 kilocals per mole, or well, something is wrong. You've made a mistake somewhere. Either the mechanism is wrong, or the value calculated is wrong, or the Hamiltonian is not good enough and provides that but because with 30 kilocals per mole the rate of reaction is too slow for any reaction to occur in your body and uh, if it is a very important one you're more likely dead by the time it would sort of uh, 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 react with the uh, uh, delta g of 30 odd so uh, that's what i mean by an educated guess uh, so um in 2015 uh, and then it went on until 2020, we actually decided to do a computational study totally based on experiment. And we went to the literature, we got uh, out all the values of the uh, uh, rates of constant, experimental rates of constant, um, yeah, uh, um, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, rates of uh, uh, catalysis. And, um, and basically what we did was we put it all together and here is, and we just published that in 2020. And if you look at it and you've got here the percentage of occurrences in the individual classes uh, as a function of uh, the delta G of activation. So the, the stepwise graph is a sum of all classes and you have, and the individual ones are with colors by colors. So for example, we started in 2015 with hydrolases. It's the uh, darkish uh, uh, blue. And you can see that the dark blue itself goes from 12 kilocals per mole to uh, 22 kilocals per mole, but already, 80% of that is in between these, uh, these uh, kilocals per mole here, these numbers here. And if you sum the whole lot, I mean, you never have, I'm saying from the values, and we got about, so our study uh, um, uh, focused on a thousand odd experimental rates uh, that uh, were uh, published um, in the literature. And it very little time goes above 24, 25 kilocals per mole. So that's what I mean. If something is 30 old, something is not quite right. Uh, so this is another way of you to know whether you've got the correct uh, energy of activation. And if you've got the correct energy of activation, in principle, you do have the correct mechanism. I'm not saying it's 100% certain. But, you know, you've got a pretty good chance of having it. So, which are the, uh, the main problems that we were faced on with uh, during these years of, uh, of um, work? Um, first of all is the Hamiltonian, then the long-range interactions, then the reactional space, and finally the conformational space. So, this is a recurrent slide which is going to turn up uh quite often in the presentation because what i'm going to do is i'm going to focus on each one of these um these major problems and tell you how 
uh, we solve them. Uh, these are, in fact, problems that we have been dealing with forever. Well, not forever, but anyway, in 2008, for example, we already talked about this, and now we are in 2020. But we now uh, have far more answers than we did happen, uh, then. So now, then, they were real problems from the point of view that we didn't have any answers. Now, at least, we've got some answers. So... Uh, with the Hamiltonian, so which one should we use? Because there are many to choose from. These are just a few, CCSDT, VLPNO, CCSDT, MP2, TFT, TFTB, semi-empirical, many more. But one thing that you have to, to, to and there are protocols as well, uh, lots of protocols, software uh, to choose from, uh, from as well. But what we'll have to keep in mind is that whichever you choose, it has to successfully deal with the nature of all energy contributions. And of course, which one to choose? Well, that also very much depends on other things, such as the group you start working with, which will have their own expertise concerning a particular software, usually, uh, usually a particular method as well, or you know, uh, the computational uh, power that you've got. Or, or else even the software uh, where you run your calculations, sometimes you have access to some, but not other. So it very much depends on that. But this is the main thing, is that the Hamiltonian has to successfully deal with the nature of all energy contributions. And if you're dealing with enzymes, you have all sorts of energy contributions in your hands to deal with. So I'll go a little bit more now with the Hamiltonian before passing on to other uh, problems. So the methods that we favor uh, are, when I say bioinformatics, I put in here everything that sometimes we've got to use as well to help us uh, setting up the system, such as if the substrate is not uh, docked into the uh, active center, we've got to use molecular docking. If we don't know part of the enzyme or even the whole enzyme, we've got to model it and do homology modeling, etc. Uh, and then we use molecular mechanics and quantum mechanics. Within the quantum mechanics, we favor definitely DFT. That's what we favor. Uh, and But we also do MP2, CCSDT, and even others. But these, these are the uh, main ones that we use. We use QMMN and have been doing so for many years. And we now um, uh, do uh, QMMN MD, uh, some of it anyway, sometimes. Uh, it, with QMMN, we have been running on Gaussian using Onium. And with QMMMD, we have been using ORCA or CP2K, uh, mostly because they are um, software uh, that are available where we can run our calculations. And so we can do it without any problems. And sometimes we have some problems into, in um, setting up other uh, software. Um, so for us, DFT is the only practical QM theoretical level at the moment. And, uh, and this obviously depends on the computational power that we've got, the systems that we deal with. Um, however, as you know, functional performance is case dependent. And as Arno was talking about just earlier on, we started by benchmarking the DFT functionals before running our QMMM calculations. And we found out that, in fact, uh, with some systems, not all of them, but with some, the difference uh, in, uh, in the results was quite remarkable. So we started uh, dabbling with different functionals um, uh, when running uh, our, or when establishing our mechanisms. So, so basically what we do is that we calculate, this is to benchmark the, the, the functionals, we calculate a reference potential energy surface at the CCSDT, CBS, CBS complete basis set uh, level, and then we benchmark the density functionals. Now, 
this uh, CCSDT CBS label has got to be has got to be done because when you benchmark a functional, you have to benchmark or whatever you benchmark anyway, you have to benchmark against something. Uh, and so what we do is we calculate the something in CCSDT and we calculate the mechanism, the whole mechanism uh, with this small system. Uh, we include zero, zero point energy, thermal effects, the uh, reactants and products are turned through IRC concrete. The, the same thing as you do with um, the, uh, uh, the enzymes as well. And we then calculate single point energy values of all relevant structures that were uh, calculated from this uh, 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 small system at the approximated level um, CCSDT CBS uh, having uh, geometry optimized with B3 lib uh, and you have then your reference to evaluate the accuracy of the density functionals. So now you go to your whichever density functionals you want to uh, look into and uh, sorry I forgot to say this so but basically as a summary we fully optimized the geomet geometry with B3 lib and then we improved the energy with the benchmarked uh, uh, functional. So when we do this, uh, we get accuracy which is close to the CCSDT CBS level in the chemistry, which is the important part, but it's not just the important part, but obviously this is important. And so you get a functional that is uh, uh, that uh, mimics very well the uh, or, or is very close. So that's what I should say to the CCSDT CBS level and with a computational cost at the DFT uh, triple uh, uh, Z uh, uh, level and uh, a system size and CPU time scaling at the DFT level which is excellent. So this is our um, experience and so since then when we trigger that we have been benchmarking our density functionals. If you want to follow something like that, you can use this uh, first reference. And in fact, I forgot to put another one, which is quite important, which was um, a study which was done by Huinev. Again, sorry, I've got it here and I forgot to pass it there, which is from 2014. So it's... Um, uh, earlier, uh, sorry, uh, at a later stage than this one was done, and I, I forgot uh, to put there the, the reference. But anyway, you can look it up uh, and see this one, which is basically the same sort of thing. Uh, so uh, here are the examples. We did this, so we've been doing them for uh, uh, many enzymes, but uh, these are uh, four, which then follow on to another example. So that's why I chose these four. And um, and these are the small systems that I'm talking to you about. Now, if you focus on this one, the diphosan exchange uh, mechanism, it's the same one that I presented to begin with so that you would recognize all the sulfurs. So what Hui did was that he uh, set up this small system which mimics what happened in the active center of the enzyme. If you remember the video that I showed with all the uh, all the disulfide bonds forming and breaking and um, he set up the mechanism for this small system he also published uh, here is uh, I was looking it up but here is the reference uh, it's JCDC 4842 in 2014 of and um, and then with this functional he then went on and uh, did the enzymatic mechanism so uh, that's what we do. Uh, and nowadays, it's actually recently, we found out something which is quite exciting, uh, which is benchmarking at the DLPNO uh, CCSDT level. And uh, if we look again at the same four uh, examples that I just gave you, a um, uh, Pietro Paiva, uh, 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 PhD student of ours uh, has evaluated the performance of this method, which has been, uh, which we owe to Frank Nies and uh, his co-workers. 
uh, and uh, at the same reference potential energy surfaces that we've uh, uh, been, uh, I mean, we, we calculated these very accurate uh, reference systems, yeah, so uh, uh, which are these four uh, and others, but Pedro only, Pedro Five only focused on these four because they are, they, they, um, uh, they, uh, they're lengthy, th these things. And uh, so we've evaluated the performance. We were not the only ones there. Uh, uh, they have been established by Frank Nice as well. Uh, and uh, in fact, but for these four, this particular four, which is our experience, the DLPNO. And so basically what was I what I was saying is that the results were very exciting from the point of view that we got uh, 0.5 kilocals per mole we were uh, uh, difference from the reference ones the reference ones being the ones at CCSDT level and just two things that I was saying uh, we didn't use any transitional metals in this reaction just basically because they didn't have any transitional methods and they were the systems and the study and uh, and we noticed that this is uh, base dependent so you really have to use a, uh, a good uh, dunning uh, basis. So um, this is more or less what I wanted to say about the benchmarking of density functionals and the Hamiltonian. So what we obviously use the Hamilton the benchmarking to uh, improve our uh, Hamiltonian as best as we possibly can. Uh, CSDT and um, um, uh, software uh, method delivered systematically better results than any density functional. Okay, good, let's go. Uh, so, uh, this is what I basically had to tell you about the Hamiltonian uh, or the, how we deal uh, with, the, with the, that and how we improve uh, the Hamiltonian that we choose. And uh, so we can uh, carry on now and go to the long range interactions. Now, how important are long range interactions? Uh, we know that they are challenging to calculate, technically speaking, which model should we choose to use? Or, I mean, by we, I'm talking about ourselves, obviously, I can only give my uh, experience and, uh, or I, I, I would only like to give my experience or should we uh, just uh, ignore them? So uh, what I can tell you is that in, a, in an enzyme, the long range interactions are very uh, many and they, are, um, they cover a very long range. They go from seven to 20 or can go from seven to 20 angstrom. So we have to be careful with them. Uh, and I shall just, I don't have much time, so I shall refer one uh, study uh, which focuses on beta uh, galactosidase, which is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis reaction of lactose into simple sugars. And as you see here, so this is what really matters uh, to me at this moment. Uh, the uh, yellow is the delta G of activation. And uh, this is a the active center of the enzyme. This is a cut of the enzyme, and this is another one. So when we had a very small, whoops, um, when we had a, a, a very small um, model of the enzyme with just obviously too small, 35 atoms in the QM part, uh, we got extremely high uh, delta Gs of activation. Uh, we then went on to 227 atoms uh, in the QM part, and sorry, in the in the in the um, yeah, it was the QM part. No, this was a QM model which, in total, had 227 atoms. So we cut uh, the the model. So basically, we used the cluster model. And we also got a very high um, delta G of activation. But when we use a large part of the enzyme, it wasn't the, the complete enzyme, but it was a large part of the enzyme, then yes, we got 15 uh, kilocals per mole, always the same mechanism uh, that was uh, studied. 
and which was um, uh, uh, was okay with the experimental uh, result, which is also uh, 50 kilocals per mole. Uh, so uh, in this particular case, these long-range interactions were determinant uh, to get a good uh, a good um, value for the delta G of activation, which helped us setting up the correct mechanism. Um, uh, is this, and there were no conformational changes here. Uh, they, these were really just long range interactions without any conformational changes. So is it always like this? No, it's not. So there are cases, many cases in which you don't have such um, such important long range interactions and they sort of um, cut off uh, much nearer the active center. But you don't really know in advance when that is so. So you have to be prepared uh, for the long range interactions uh, to be uh, quite important for your calculation. So we tend to use, if we can, the whole enzyme or at least the whole monomer, if it is a case of uh, many um, of a dimer or trimer or whatever. Um, but uh, we, we, we are careful with the long range interactions. We think they are important and uh, we want to include them if we can. Um, so for the reactional space, well, there can be great diversity of the reactional space with often quite unexpected chemistry when compared to solution chemistry. So this means that you're in for problems with the reactional space from the point of view that if it is a complicated reaction, you're, you have to uh, sample this reactional space uh, very well. So you set up your hypothesis, mechanistic hypothesis, which can come from experiment or not. Uh, and uh, but whether it comes or not, you really have to study all the reactional space, which can be complicated. And I'll just would like to uh, run you through an, an example, which sort of uh, uh, probably scarred my uh, uh, one of my very talented PhD students, Pedro Freire, uh, which very recently established the catalytic mechanism of human aldehyde oxidase and the whole thing is a bit of a nightmare because as you see uh, the reactional space is very diverse it had two molybdenum atoms uh, and they kept changing uh, oxidation state uh, quite a lot of steps of uh, uh, mechanistic steps and uh, and it took a long time so um, my advice, uh, if I can, uh, sort of give to uh, each of the people that are not so used to doing this every day. Um, the reactional space can be very complex and you really have to think that the more complex the Hamiltonian, the more difficult it becomes to solve the problem. So you have to compromise. Uh, you can't use a Hamiltonian that you know that probably we go, could give you uh, a wrong uh, answer, uh, but you have to compromise and still get one that will be able to uh, give you the correct answer. And also, um, establishing, for me, establishing an enzymatic mechanism is like solving a puzzle to a certain extent, i.e every single bit of correct experimental or otherwise information must fit and cannot be left out. So you can't just say, oh, um, this experimental, this experiment or this experience uh, give, uh, gives us, I don't know, the PKA of uh, histidine, which means that it is um, solvated or not, or, uh, 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 or, not, uh, or whatever. Uh, you can't just say, "Oh, I will disregard this." No, you can. You have uh, to 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 fit it in, and uh, and nothing should be left out. Everything has got to to fit, and so that you know that you really have got the the, the right uh, mechanism. 
And finally, the uh, conformational space, uh, which how determinant is it to sample enzyme conformations? Uh, so a lot of people do QMMMD, Caprinello, uh, metadynamics and all this, and they do uh, excellent work, I mean, really first class work. Uh, other people don't. Or Carpinello or anything else that includes dynamics. This is not. Don't don't take me wrong. Uh, is that I? We have been doing it basically because we couldn't afford for a long time. We couldn't afford doing other than QMMM. Um, and uh, and we find that still do uh, that we get a lot out of it. A lot of detail out of it and i'll give you an example so that you understand my point of view and i hope you do um, so let's start with single conformation uh, calculation so i'm talking about qmmm in which you start with a conformation to start studying your uh, your mechanism your your uh, reaction mechanism and with it we can identify uh, structural features of reactant conformations and understand very well the structure activity relationship. Uh, so uh, let me uh, present to you alpha amylase. Uh, this is what the enzyme looks like. This is the active center. Uh, 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 we've got the sugar for a substrate and two catalytic uh, or two mechanisms, sorry, uh, two uh, residues that are catalytic. Uh, so We've got this uh, glycosidic uh, oxygen that is, um, sorry, here, that is protonated um, by uh, glue uh, 233. And uh, what happens is that this bond breaks, and then there is a nucleophilic uh, uh, addition by uh, ASP196. So it's not uh, terribly complicated. We established the mechanism for. Um, the enzymatic mechanism, we used onium, so we did co single uh, conformation uh, calculations, just once started with one conformation, that was basically the X-ray one, um, and uh, we still had to optimize because of the substrate to be put in place and all that. We include, we used, um, so p 3 lib for uh, the, uh, the geometry optimization and then MO6, 2X, for the energy, um, so we basically benchmarked. Uh, we included, we did everything, so included CPE, so thermal effects, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, well, we started with just one confirmation, so you know the uh, the, the doubt always uh, is uh, is there, thinking uh, what if I used another confirmation to begin with. And to take away that uh, uh, problem, we decided to run a, a dynamic city simulation, a long one, and selected snapshots from that MD simulation. Uh, these snapshots were not selected at random because you have to understand that when we run uh, a long dynamic simulation, the space, the conformational space that you sample is incredibly large. There is absolutely no way that you can sample or, or they can, you, you can study uh, with detail all these, um, all these uh, different conformations. So we wanted to sample those that were very near uh, the, the, um, uh, the start of the catalytic mechanism, because those are the ones that are going to be important for catalysis, which is basically what we want, uh, start, you know, study cata catalysis, but uh, the catalytic reaction, but with a different uh, conformation. So um, uh, these, uh, these uh, conformations that we looked for were those that were predicted to be adequate, uh, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that uh, sort of, uh, uh, were um, followed adequate criteria for reactivity. And how did we do that? Uh, so we looked at our, at our uh, active center, 
I included here, well, here are the catalytic uh, uh, residues. I included this one as well, as 300, because it's also, it's not catalytic, it doesn't go into catalysis, but it's a structural, um, a structural uh, residue because holds the sugar in place because of doing uh, hydrogen bonding uh, bonds with um, the hydroxyls that are uh, on these two carbons. So what we did was we looked for the confirmations that, uh, first of all, the distance from ASP196 uh, to carbon C1 was under uh, 3.5 uh, angstrom. So I kept here the mechanism so that you uh, are you remember it. And then we also, uh, at the same time, these confirmations had to um, uh, um, have the structural hydrogen bonds, so these hydrogen bonds, between ASP300 and the hydroxyl groups attached to uh, C2 and C3 and the 2.5 angstrom. Uh, so that's what we looked for, those confirmations. And uh, we selected 40 of them. Uh, and we, for each one of them, we uh, solved the mechanism yet again. So we ended up with 40 free energy barriers of activation. For each of them, we repeated the exact protocol that we had followed for the first uh, single confirmation, uh, the X-ray basically optimized, uh, that we used to begin with. And this is what we got. So we got what we called a multiple pairs uh, uh, analysis, so to speak, in which you uh, can plot this from with the activation barrier as a function of time and a function of each of the uh, initial structures that you uh, start with um, to, to uh, establish uh, again and again and again your mechanism. And for the X-ray, so the experimental value is 14. Uh, the X-ray, we got uh, 11. And look at this. Uh, we have a very wide range of, um, of uh, barriers of activation. And you have to remember that these were all chosen as being catalytic or near catalytic uh, 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 structures or structures good for catalysis so to speak with the distances good for catalysis and uh, and these are the only uh, in 40 of them uh, the only four that we managed to catch that really uh, could be uh, important for catalysis so basically what happens is that you sample all this conformational space most of it is no good for catalysis and then uh, eventually comes a, um, a, uh, a structure that sort of fits into those uh, criteria for reactivity and, uh, and, uh, and you have a reaction. So we've done this in the past for uh, many, uh, many enzymes. I just put here these. This was the very first one in 2012 for HIV-1 integrase, but then we followed and went on. And this is also the alpha amylase, as I told you. This is just to tell you, to show you that it wasn't sort of something uh, that is very strange. It doesn't. So this follows a pattern. Uh, so we can say that the small number of barriers accounts for the very most of the observed rate. This is experimental averaging, uh, so to speak. Uh, and the average barrier is very similar. So these average barriers, the, the, the ones that are good for catalysis, are very similar to the X-ray single conformation free energy. And that's what we always found. If there is not some big problem with the X-ray uh, file, obviously. Uh, so going back to alpha amylase, we looked into all the structures, the 40 structures that we had initially selected, um, and we saw that these low activation barriers only occurred if a set of geometric conditions was verified. And, um, and it wasn't exactly the ones that we anticipated and that we looked for to begin with. So what we found was that uh, 
okay, this and uh, a water molecule that uh, goes and comes back, so to speak. Uh, and this was very surprised because I mean, these distances are implicated in the reaction coordinate, but this one is not. Um, but uh, so what eventually, so we, we, we had to study this obviously, and we uh, came up with the conclusion that what happens is that this H bond lowers the activation barriers and basically it controls this the pka value of this uh, general acid uh, uh, glue 233 and therefore the water molecule switches the enzyme on and off and i say on the time on the nanosecond time scale because that's the one that we uh, analyzed uh, so this is a um uh an example that I wanted to uh, present to you uh, to show you uh, that uh, uh, these QMM uh, calculations can be very interesting to find all sorts of details. Uh, and uh, just to see what we could find out by averaging over an ensemble of confirmations, since we only uh, looked at one at a time. Uh, we went on to do uh, QMMM uh, MD calculations on the same amylase with the same um, mechanism of reaction. And so these are here the QMMM results. These are the QMMM uh, results. I'll just quickly run you through this so that you understand. So here for the QMMM, these are uh, the results that you get out of that uh, uh, MD simulation from which we got the 40 initial structures. So the black dots represent the confirmations obtained during the MD simulation of the solvated enzyme substrate uh, complex, all these black dots. And the colored dots uh, represent confirmation, the confirmations, that those 40 confirmations that we got out of the uh, MD simulation and which uh, conform uh, to those um, initial uh, that initial uh, initial criteria for reactivity that I pointed out to you. And uh, so the the green dots uh, have got a lower uh, activation barrier, and the, the the red dots are those that go up to 30 kilocals per mole. And what we found out in running the QMMD uh, simulations is that if we started with a red uh, uh, dot, I. Uh, um, uh, um, confirmation that was a bit more out of uh, the catalytic one, still one of those 40, um, we had some trouble, or not some trouble, but it took uh, much more time to make it converge to the catalytic uh, value, to, the, uh, to the, the delta G of activation, the, the real, real uh, the one, the, the best one that we could uh, get. And uh, it took uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, sampling uh, to do that. But if we went to uh, uh, a green one, for example, then we were already there. It didn't take any time. And to a yellow one, it also didn't take much time. So we started here and went on and uh, and uh, got the the uh, the the the, the real, the, the more accurate one, uh, so to speak. And uh, if we started with the X-ray, we are also already there, uh, more or less. So, uh, basically, what I want to say is that these uh, calculations are very robust, very good, uh, and uh, uh, but these others gave, a, gave us an awful lot of detail that we wouldn't have got from this, because obviously you can't go on and uh, uh, study uh, many of these confirmations, you will get lost in this uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, conformational space that is uh, sampled. Uh, so obviously you cannot do the two all the time, we were actually having a conversation uh, this morning 
uh, with Pedro Ferreira over, over this, uh, but the, 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 really the best thing is to use several methods and see what comes out of this. That's how you learn to uh, know your enzyme very, very well. So um, we have other examples that also behave like this. So uh, João Coimbra uh, is also doing uh, calculations on protease, uh, HIV-1 protease, which uh, take us to the same, uh, uh, the same ideas, so to speak. And um, so, well, I've run you through, through all these problems. Uh, it's now time to, uh, to stop. Uh, as uh, conclusions, uh, well, I'll just say some of them, activation free energy, substrate binding free energy and the enzyme efficiency fall in a very narrow range of values for all enzymes, as we saw. Uh, the Hamiltonian has to successfully deal with the nature of all energy contributions. If using DFT benchmarking functionals before embarking QMMM calculations is good practice, the subset of catalytic competent conformations can be significantly small in comparison with the full conformational landscape of enzyme substrate complexes. Usually you find X-ray is okay as a starting conformation if there are not major errors, uh, obviously, of the, 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 the X-ray conformation. Uh, single conformation QMMM calculations enable us to understand better the structure activity relationship uh, however, many other techniques that explore more efficiently the conformational space of the enzyme during catalysis uh, are used, providing a more dynamic picture into the analysis of the potential energy surfaces associated to catalysis. And I just would like to uh, thank, uh, first of all, Professor Piotr Fernandes. We've got, uh, we have my colleague, we have been uh, collaborating for years. Uh, my uh, three, uh, this is not all my group, but they are the, 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 the people that um, uh, uh, contributed the most to some of the things I said here. Uh, so Rui, João and uh, uh, Natasia are, um, have got research fellowships. They were former uh, PhD students of, of mine. And um, then my uh, two PhD students, Pedro Freire, and Pedro Paiva, so Pedro did, Pedro Paiva did the AOX mechanism, uh, Pedro Paiva did the LPNO CCSDT work, and um, these are not my <laughs> two students, but they are my ex-PhD students, uh, so Diogo Sancho Martins is now at Scripps, and uh, Rita uh, Calisto is uh, at the University of uh, Uppsala, and um, well, uh, here are some of the people that have been helping us, both with money and um, uh, computational um, power. And uh, well, and I would like to thank you for hearing. Uh, and uh, now uh, you can ask questions if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. That was, uh, I think, really, uh, really valuable for people who, um, especially, are coming new to this to see this outline, uh, very clear outline of, uh, you know, the different things to, to take into account. The protocol. Um, I'm sorry if it took too long. Uh, no, that's uh, I so that, this is great. Bit. I think this is great. Do either of my biological colleagues, Gerrit or Mariana, would you like to ask any questions before I do? Yeah, so while we wait for questions to come in, I can already uh, ask a few questions that, that came up while, while listening to your to your very nice talk. Um, so when you do the MD simulations to, to, to scan for or to, to look for confirmations from where to start the QMM, and what you then find is you find different barriers. However, the time to, to, to make transitions between these confirmations is apparently really short in the order of nanoseconds, suggesting that the barriers between them are really small. So what I then do not so well understand, and, and we also encounter this, so it's not that I'm doubting the result, it's just that I don't understand why during optimization you then don't cross that small little barrier and then take the lower barrier confirmation that was uh, that belongs to a, to a different type of confirmation, perhaps the one that's closer to the X-ray structure. Can you I'm comment? So, I'm sorry. You're, well, I can't because I only just heard the very, very oh. last part of your Oops. question. This thing just went off. Uh, so okay. if you don't I'll, I'll repeat, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah. So I'll repeat the question. 
So in the in the plot of in the in, in, in the last part of your talk when you're discussing the the the, in the contribution of sampling conformations, there you see that uh, if you simulate the the system for a while, a couple of nanoseconds, and if you're taking different snapshots at, at, at let's say nanoseconds apart, if I recall correctly, you find that the barriers they vary widely. My question is yes. what I don't understand, and this is not, this is something that that we also observe, but what I do not understand is if you do an optimization why does the optimizer not bring you first back to the original confirmation because the barrier must be super super low because it's, it's sampled within nanoseconds so the barrier cannot be very high between these different confirmations why does the optimizer not take you first back to the lowest say energy confirmation from where the energy barrier to the transition state is the lowest well because it can be very far apart in the potential energy surface and the uh, um, if it is too far no. apart, well, th Be they are. But it's only uh, 200 the, picoseconds, for example. So between 11 and 11.2, there is only 200 picoseconds difference. And between well, 13.2 and 15.6, only two nanoseconds difference. You cannot cover so much conformational space in, in such a short time, I would assume. Yeah, but it, with the uh, potential energy surface, the algorithm of uh, optimization is not good enough uh, to uh, to do that. Uh, so when you try uh, to uh, uh, to use a QMM uh, method, that doesn't happen. Uh, so you 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 do the best you can, uh, but uh, it's not. It just takes a little bit of um, uh, of change in your activation uh, in your site in your uh, active site uh, to give you a very high barrier. Uh, and uh, the, the 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 problem is the uh, and you can show this mathematically. In fact, uh, the uh, and that's a preconcept, uh, sort of a preconceived idea that people do have, is that the uh, the the, um, the catalytic conformation is the lowest uh, that you can find, but uh, it it doesn't have to be. Uh, it can be. It doesn't have to be uh, in the. Um, in the lowest point, uh, so we we it, it does make a difference. And also the, the the algorithm that you use, and we use several, whatever we can, uh, are not good enough uh, to immediately go to the one that you anticipate uh, to be the catalytic confirmation. Um, so uh, this is what we get. And uh, it happens with all the cases that we have looked into. Uh, and uh, well, that's basically what I can tell you. Mm -hmm. OK, there is now no being quest there has been questions. I have assigned it to you. So I switch off my, my microphone now. Uh, Julio says a very nice presentation. Uh, regarding multiple PES calculations, clustering analysis can help in order to reduce the number of structures from a large MD simulation, that's a question. <laughs> Can PS calculation clustering analysis help in order to reduce the number of structures from a large MD simulation? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, we, we, yeah, we, we, we did that as well. Uh, so clusterizing, you know, and then, uh, and then um, uh, try to get to the uh, catalytic structures from there. That's something you can do as well. Uh, but the answer is always the same. Uh, so if you get something that is a little bit uh, different from uh, um, from uh, the, um, um, the, the the catalytic uh, uh, distances, uh, then the activation barrier is very high. Um, so um, that's basically that. Part of the other part of the question was, do you have any study comparing clustering analysis structures with the protocol that you're working with? Uh, you may have already addressed that. But. Um, well, yes, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I can if you send me your uh, your uh, uh, email, uh, I can send you some references. Uh, 
I can't yeah, remember. Julio, them. Julio, yeah, that's fine. Okay, we can do that. Julio, yeah? if you want to put your email into the question, then we'll get yeah. you in touch. Yeah, yeah. Email, yeah. There's another question, I think. Um, um, the question is, can we correlate the calculated free energy barrier with experimental KCAT or CAM values if the rate limiting step is not known? If so, what is the best way to correlate them? And if we know it is a good correlation, can we use that as evidence to confirm the identity of the rate limiting step in an enzymatic reaction? Oh, yes, I mean, yeah, well, it's it's really the, the um, rates of reaction, they vary so little. They, they, they really are, uh, uh, so if you don't know them, you can always make as I said at the beginning, that educated guess, because they, they really, uh, most of them are in within the range of um, 14 kilocals per mole and uh, 20 or so. Um, that's, that's a very, very narrow range of values. They're all there. 80% are following that uh, uh, in that region. So you can correlate anything you like, you know, as soon as you get those values, basically. Hang on, I can see uh, Amani's question now. So, oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yes, with the Arrhenius law, you can co co uh, correlate, sorry, actually, I understood the, uh, another question. You can calculate the free energy barrier uh, from KCAT. So basically, what uh, I was saying uh, is that uh, uh, you can uh, calculate uh, the uh, um, the delta G of activation from the KCAT. There is an equation that lets us do that, the Arrhenius equation. So you can also uh, go the other way around if that is your question. So if you have the delta G of activation, you can. Uh, uh, go back to the KCAT as well. Uh, so another question is, uh, in your multiple pest calculations, do you impose any kind of restraints in the coordinations to main groups of the TS uh, structures? Uh, so uh, as I, so uh, I imagine that in your multiple pest calculations, you mean by, to, you, you mean that uh, uh, in the, the, the we are using your, we're calculating structure by structure, yeah, one confirm, confirmation at a time. So when you do one confirmation at a time, no, we did not impose any restrictions in the coordinations to the main groups of the TS structures, or at least we try not to, unless we see that uh, um, uh, there is, or we know, that there is a, a particular interaction that has got to be there. Uh, and then we can restrict it, say, uh, to groups or whatever. But on in principle, no, we don't. I can't see anything else. Okay, well, I can, uh, I can read out uh, the question. Um, so uh, thanks for the very inspiring talk uh, to somebody else. Uh, I have a question. In case the X-ray structure is not available, would you still recommend to perform such calculations using a homology model? Well, um, if you have to use a homology model, because you really have to um, uh, do some sort of project that uh, in which you have to, um, then you know. Um, it's not such a good idea, uh, or it can be difficult, because if you make a mistake, even if it is a small one with the homology model, then you might not get to the correct mechanism, or at least if you are in the correct mechanism, you might not get to the correct um, uh, barrier. Um, this doesn't mean that we don't do uh, uh, mechanisms with homology modeling, but they always pose more problems than the others. Um, that's our experience uh, in the matter. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it or that we don't do it, 
uh, I'm just saying that uh, it is um, we're in for more problems usually. <laughs> um, so oh, he responded actually saying thanks. It makes sense. So thank you for that. Uh, there's a follow-up question to Gareth's question uh, from Dimitri. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk, Marie. And uh, I, I have the following question. So basically, uh, it's kind of following up to the Gareth question. Uh, so basically, when you do first this kind of uh, PS calculation, yeah, and in the next slides you also show, showed the uh, uh, what happens if you do QMMD free energy calculation. Basically, I, I suppose it's umbrella sampling or something like that, or metadynamics. But for me, it seems like you can take from, at least from the QMMD, uh, you can take even a very bad starting structure and after some not so long equilibration time with QMMD and sampling, you still can get a correct energy barrier, no? Yes, of course. So, I yeah. mean, if you are you mm -hmm. asking me if I could do the multiple pairs out of the QMMM MD simulation? Uh, yeah, my, mm -hmm. my question is what is more expensive and what is should be done in general. So you one one thing you can do a lot of PS calculations. Well, On the second the, hand, you can yeah, do QMMD, the, long QMMD. <laughs> Uh, you, you can do QMMMD and uh, still look into uh, single confirmations, obviously. I mean, nothing uh, uh, stops you from doing that. But the amount that you sample is such that I, I'm not quite sure how easy that will be. So what we like to do is, or personally, what I like to do is QMMM because I think it's so much more fun. QMMMD is more robust. I'm not going to dispute that. Uh, but it's very automatic as well. I don't like very automatic things. Uh, I always find that if you have to think about something, you get more out of it. Um, but QMMMD or uh, metadynamics or whatever are more robust uh, methods. Uh, so I, I think that it is a matter of, uh, it all boils down to a matter of personal taste and what you can get out of the uh, methods that you have at your disposition, the amount of computational time that you can afford, um, the software that you have available, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and okay, that's yeah. why you've got so many, so many groups with uh, all doing uh, different, uh, things to basically get a, a mechanism of an enzymatic reaction somehow okay yeah yeah thanks yeah so i don't see any other question from oh Gerrit still has, still has, a, has, a, has a question that you would like to ask Gerrit, go ahead you can uh, go ahead well always um yeah the question i have is going back to the observation that you find that the barrier is always around what was it 40 kilocal per mole um, I wonder, is this because enzymes have been optimized to work at the diffusion limit, so that at a certain point in time at which it, it, it takes for the, for the reactants, for the substrate to actually find the enzyme, is becoming the rate limiting step and further optimization doesn't make any, any sense from an evolutionary point of view? Sorry, I didn't hear your question. Yeah, you have, no, you have to... Okay, so this goes back to the observation that all the barriers fall in the same range, that 80% or so in the same interval of, what was it, around 20 yeah. kilocalorie per mole. And I was wondering, is that, could that, yeah. could you speculate whether that is maybe due to the fact that the diffusion limit would probably then become the rate limiting step if you optimize the enzyme further, so there would be no evolutionary pressure, so to speak, to actually make the enzyme even faster, because then the rate limiting step is the diffusion process of the substrate into the active site. Um, so this is what you're talking about, right? Yes, indeed. Okay, so um, this is the activation energy that we get uh, out of experiments, so to speak. So I think that what it is, I mean, it's related to the fact uh, that we need um, reactions in our body that are fast enough uh, to happen in a very short time. Uh, I mean, if my trips in, that takes hours to uh, cut the amino acids, uh, I'm going to have indigestion. 
that's for sure. Um, so this is connected. The, 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 the rate of reaction and the, the delta G of activation is connected with that. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, evolution, if I heard correctly. Yeah, so what I meant is that the enzymes have op been optimized throughout evolution to reach the point that the rate limiting step is now the diffusion process. So that the time it takes for a ligand, in this case a peptide or whatever the ligand is for the enzyme, to move into the active site. So that if the enzyme would be more efficient than that, then you don't gain much because the rate limiting step would then be the diffusion would be the diffusion limit. Yeah, yeah, I understand that, yeah. But in fact, the uh, uh, it can be also uh, other 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 uh, roles, can be other physical process, can be uh, in, um, in, on, in play. Uh, mass flow, diffusion, mass transfer area, all these can come into play. Now, if, uh, if you ask me that evolution has optimized the enzymes for the diffusion process, I'm not sure if that is the case, because I think that with this apparent, apparent activation energy that comes to us from... Hello? Yeah. Yes, Hello. I can yeah. hear you again. Yes. We, lost, we lost you at uh, this, activation, this apparent activation energy is coming from something. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So these are the apparent activation energies that come from uh, the uh, uh, experimental values and the exper experiments coming uh, from uh, um, labs uh, that uh, usually do these things. Now, they don't know exactly uh, if uh, reaction rates uh, come from the the diffusion processes or mass transfer area, for example, that will be into play as well, mass flow. Uh, it can be from all sorts of, um, as well as the chemical processes as well, uh, also. So uh, it can be several factors, and I am not sure, and I don't think anybody is, uh, if mass if, if diffusion uh, is the major player and it comes from evolution. I personally am not very convinced about that. I think there are other factors into play. Um, okay. That's my idea. Do you have any idea about that? No, Do no, but the observation. That, uh, yeah. Uh, no, but so the observation. I, I don't think so. Yeah, sorry. No, no, you, I was just going to confirm that no, I don't have a clear idea either, but the observation that barriers are all in the same range that has been observed yeah. Yeah, in several studies. So I was thinking there must mm -hmm. be something mm -hmm. underlying it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, well, it's got to do with the, with the fact that uh, with very high barriers, you know, I mean, our, our body wouldn't survive. But um, if exactly, you know, enzymes were optimized for that, I think there are many factors into play. I don't think it can just be that, but uh, you know, this is just a spe speculation. Mm -hmm. Good. I ask for the speculation, so this is fine. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. I I have one quick question, one last quick question, um, and it's about software. So you said that in your group you use both CP2K and Orca. I was just curious whether there's a preference for one or the other in the context of the availability of particular PACE sets, particular the functionals, or whether it's about what size of number of QM atoms you're dealing with, or whether it's to do with your computational resources. Basically, when do you use one, which one, and when do you use the other, and why? Um, whenever we use, um, we want to use DP, DLPNO, the CCSDT, we have to use ORCA because it's implemented there. Uh, and uh, for, so um, that is one reason why we use ORCA. But ORCA is quite uh, nice to use. Um, we were, uh, we started with um, CP2K because we uh, started running in Oak Ridge National Laboratory and uh, 
it was difficult to set the other software there. And so we were a little bit pushed into CP2K, whether we liked it or not, we had to uh, start using it. And then we sort of got used to it, basically, because you start with one software and you start getting used to it. Uh, but we run both. Uh, and uh, probably at the moment, uh, we're running more CP2K than anything else. But as I said, if you want to go into the LPNO, you have a CCDT, you have to go into Orca uh, to do that. We like them both, really. Um, uh, okay. They provide the answers. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, with that, I think we've come to the end of our question and answer session as well. So I just wanted to take the opportunity on behalf of you know, our, all of us organizers from BioXL and all the attendees as well to, to, to thank you very much for this talk. I think it's very valuable uh, for people who are coming to this, uh, maybe uh, fresh to draw on your experience and uh, you know, highlighting different different aspects that you take into account, and especially sort of this, this benchmarking protocol, I think, I think it's quite nice uh, for functionals. So, okay, so next Monday we have uh, another uh, uh, webinar coming up that's relevant um, for this workshop, as part of this workshop, um, which is uh, Adrian Mulholland will be presenting on uh, the topic of uh, Tubert's chemical accuracy in QMA modeling, uh, also enzyme catalysis, uh, and also protein ligand binding. So it's all lot, lot, lots of good stuff still to come as well next Monday. But for now, thank you again, Maria, uh, for, uh, for your presentation and uh, for dealing with the uh, GoToWebinar technical issues. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye. 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 bye.